Hello, everybody. I'm Therese Coffey. I'm the uh, Secretary of State in the United Kingdom uh, Government for the Department of Work and Pensions. And you might wonder why I'm here, but it is a really important part of uh, mobilising climate finance. Uh, Dr Ngozi is on her way. Uh, like many of you who are so committed to coming to COP, it's uh, taking a little bit of time to get through the processing, but uh, it's uh, uh, hopefully worth the wait. Um, so it is really good to be here at COP. I've actually attended COP uh, uh, for the last two occasions physically as the UK's Environment Minister, and then I moved to a different role within the UK government. Uh, and one of the exciting things about taking on the pensions portfolio and the, the regulation approach there is all the work that we are already leading, I think, the world in, in what we're trying to do in uh, unlocking investment uh, so that we can be on this journey together to achieve net zero. So practical actions to help protect the planet... And I was really pleased with my um, uh, colleague, uh, Zach Goldsmith, uh, all the work he's done on the Forest Declaration today. But I think the largely unseen and enabling force behind often very visible, large-scale green interventions and projects is green finance. And we are focusing on mobilising finance to fight climate change, and it's to deliver prosperity and protection for people and the planet in our race to net zero. And let's be candid, without harnessing the firepower of finance, especially for emerging markets and developing countries, our task ahead is near impossible. Public finance really does have an important role to play in meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. But public finance alone will not meet the trillions of pounds of dollars of investment we need, and private sector investment is essential especially given the size and the scale of the challenge and investment needed to achieve it. So this session is about looking ahead on how we can overcome some of the barriers to mobilising private climate finance, such as the quality of project pipelines and the limited availability of blended financing vehicles. But I do like to think the UK is leading the way. As a donor, we are the largest contributor to the Green Climate Fund, which last month reached a landmark milestone having allocated $10 billion in climate finance across the globe. And the UK, I believe, is also a strong force in breaking down barriers to investment and action, turning dollars into delivery and pounds into projects on the ground. And in that task, we are working with a broad range of partners, not only the wider donor community, but developing and emerging market countries, the multilateral uh, uh, system, the development banks, and private finance actors, along with many other uh, countries, just to name but a few. And an initiative born out of this kind, welcome, uh, of, of genuine multilateral collaboration. This morning, the Chancellor, uh, Rishi Sunak, has announced the new CIF capital markets mechanism that aims to issue billions of uh, pounds in green bonds in the City of London. And at its full potential, this will help provide an additional $700 million per year towards clean energy infrastructure in developing countries significantly contributing to the $100 billion goal. And I'm sure you will hear more about this shortly from the CEO of CIF. Now, through the UK's £10 million Climate Finance Accelerator, we are helping the emerging economies of Nigeria, South, America, South Africa, Colombia, Mexico, Peru and Turkey to build a pipeline of bankable low-carbon projects. And we, help to, we hope to help even more countries soon. And here in the UK, as the Chancellor announced last week in the autumn budget, we are doing more to remove barriers to invest, investment, making it easier for pensions to invest in green assets with all the benefits that can bring. So we can truly unlock the potential of green finance here and around the world. Now, as well as opening up these huge opportunities for economic growth, we're also the first in the world to legally require that pension trustees assess and publish the financial risks from climate change. And last month, we went further setting out how we expect pension schemes to measure and publish how the investments they make support the Paris Agreement. Now, fundamentally, the fiduciary duty on trustees is to act in the interests of savers. And that is complementary to and is not in conflict with protecting people, our planet and delivering prosperity. Given their global footprint, trustees are genuine stewards of our pension schemes and of our planet too. Now, these are just a few examples of green finance in action. I'm meeting uh, people from other uh, uh, governments around the world. Uh, I really want to urge countries to come together and harness the power of finance to help propel us to net zero and to our greener, more sustainable and more prosperous future. 
And we're proud to be working with a range of other global leaders to do this. And I'm delighted to welcome some of those leaders to this event. Today's focus and the purpose of COP26 is a call to action to mobilise, to increase momentum, to break down barriers and find shared solutions, particularly in the developing world. Because the race, the race to keep 1.5 alive is a race the whole world must win together. And it's now my absolute pleasure to hand over to the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi Okonya Owela. You're very welcome, Madam. Thank you, Secretary, uh, for that. And a uh, warm welcome to all the panelists and, and to the audience. I'm delighted to chair today's panel on such an important topic. As the Secretary of State noted, while public finance plays an extremely important role in supporting the transition to net zero and a climate resilient future, it will not be enough on its own. There is great potential for green finance. For example, to reach our global clean energy and infrastructure goals alone, over $4 trillion in investment is needed annually. This figure sounds daunting, but we already have significant levels of existing infrastructure investment, demonstrating that much of the story is about transitioning finance rather than mobilizing entirely new investment. And the value of assets under management in the global financial system last year topped 100 trillion, which clearly far outstrips what is needed to face this challenge. So the capital is there, and as we will all hear about today, more and more investors are ready and willing to invest into green solutions in emerging and developing markets. At the same time, we must have the transparency tools to make sure that climate finance does not lead to greenwashing. The harmonization of climate-related financial procedures is also important in this regard. For instance, over 1,000 financial institutions responsible for assets over $200 trillion have supported the recommendations by the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Such initiatives, <clears throat> as well as others, can help ramp up climate finance while, whilst ensuring that the transparency framework for financing is robust and climate credible. When I was Finance Minister of Nigeria, I faced the challenge of rapidly aligning investment plans and policy frameworks to crucial public goods required by an emerging economy heavily reliant on fossil fuels. I know firsthand how difficult it is to bring different actors together. I also know firsthand from my time as Managing Director of the World Bank the critical role that partnerships uh, from the donor community um, can, can be, along with multilateral uh, development banks, to help um, partner governments and the private sector navigate this transition. Now, in my current role as Director General of the World Trade Organization, I cannot fail to mention the role that trade plays, together with a realignment of climate flows and proper climate policies, in making sure that we move to a low carbon development pathway. We urgently need to align finance for trade with climate objectives, but we also urgently need to streamline trade financing needs into climate finance policies. We need to ensure that the low carbon solutions and innovations created through financing can reach the places where they are needed the most, irrespective of where they are produced. That's why I'm excited to listen to the panels, panel this morning and hear more details about increased ambition in this area later this afternoon at the president, presidency event on mobilization. From now, uh, <clears throat> looking to draw on some unique perspectives from our panelists about their leading roles in mobilizing finance, we look at national, multilateral, and the private sector and how they can all contribute to our goals. Let me then turn and welcome our panelists, the Finance Minister of Uruguay, uh, Mr. Azuchena Abelet. <laughs> I hope I didn't... Uh, it's, it's Miss. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, that's even yeah. worse. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay, it, I, have, I have... It's Mrs. Mrs., Mrs. okay. Yes. I, I have the wrong gender here, so... 
uh, hope all is forgiven. Um, Mafalda Duarte, the CEO of Climate Investment Funds, so I don't attach any labels anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Philippe Valahu, CEO of Private Investment, Private Infrastructure Development Group, and uh, Noel Quinn, the CEO of HSBC. So without uh, further ado, let's begin our discussion, and I'll turn to our colleague, Mrs. <laughs> Abeleche from Uruguay, the finance minister. Um, let me start, if I can go back to a seat and sit down for a moment. Hello. Oh, that's better. Thank you. So my, my, my question to you um, is what challenges and opportunities do you see for Uruguay and the wider region in attracting private investment? And given your role as incoming chair of the Development Committee at the World Bank, how can the donor community and multilateral actors step up to address these. Thank you very much, Director General. Let me begin uh, sharing with you how we see the, the moment that we are facing right now. We think that there, we can use the power of financial incentives to reward sustainable policy making. That's the, the main focus. This, uh, I said this during the last uh, development committee in, in DC, like two weeks ago, because I really think that the my ministers of, of finance, we do have a main role in mainstreaming climate change in uh, economic policy. So it, it putting in very simple terms, we need to walk the talk. The, the focus has to be in delivering credible action in delivering prosperity, as was said by the Secretary of State. So in that regard, I think that first of all, developed countries must comply with the, the commitment to deploy resources into achieving uh, climate uh, goals, especially in most vulnerable countries. And secondly, I think that all countries, we must put the right incentives in place so that we can move from pledges to concrete action. I would say that for us, that is the, the main message. In that sense, we think that the moment right now is ripe for financial innovation. And I'm now going into your question. And this financial innovation, in terms of Uruguay, is uh, studying the issuance of a sovereign sustainability linked bond, linked to uh, indicators, environmental indicators, that have an international recognition. So this is a way to explicitly incorporate looking forward environmental indicators, commitments. These commitments must be part of the bond co covenants, and also not only of the bond covenants, but we are speaking with multilateral agencies and with different donors so that this um, futures can also be part of the uh, loans dispersed from multilaterals. So uh, what we think that we are speaking of a new asset class where we are, um, which has a very particular future where we link the cost of borrowing of the sovereign with the environmental behavior. So this link is what allows us to make concrete progress I would say that we're speaking about mainstreaming NDCs. I thought that I had more time, but it seems that I have to go quicker. So going directly to the case of Uruguay, we are uh, now moving from pandemic to recovery, and we are starting since last year. We have been starting with the Ministry of, of Livestock and Agriculture, with the Ministry of Industry, with the Environmental Industry uh, Ministry. We are working on the issuance of a sub uh, sustainability-linked bond, which is different from the green bond where you issue and the use of proceeds go to a green project. And we are the, the idea is to have key performance indicators to set goals on those key performance indicators. And I'm thinking, again, at, uh, of the NTC's uh, indicators. So 
the idea of mainstreaming the, what we uh, present in our strateg environmental strategies, and then um, the coupon, the interest rate that we pay, is related to the uh, result that we have in terms of uh, environmental behavior. So there could be a step up or a step down in terms of the, the, the final coupon. So this is about aligning incentives of the sovereign with the uh, environmental behavior. It's really about al al aligning the incentives of investors, private investors, uh, of the donors, of multilateral agencies, of the financing system, and the sovereign. So it's only if we really think of, um, of our behavior, uh, environmental behavior, as providing public goods that we will all sit together and have the, the, the same incentives to move forward and really uh, walk the talk, as I said. Uh, we think, just to wrap up, we think that we are at an inflec inflection point right now where we must mainstream climate action in the design of public policies. As part of this momentum, we think that the development of this environmentally linked financial instrument tied to quantitative targets on climate change can accelerate the results we need to see. Again, I'm insisting on mainstreaming NDCs in sovereign climate finance, and as was said by the Gen Director General, also in terms of the benefits that we can have in, uh, for, for trading. For a small country like Uruguay, incorporating the country's environmental behavior in the preference in terms of, uh, of trade is as, as important as uh, incorporating this in terms of financing. So this innovative funding uh, mechanism that I've shared this morning tied to climate can underpin a new development model for a transformed world. As was said by the State uh, Secretary in the introduction, we must deliver prosperity. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister, and some very interesting things. I like, we must walk the talk. And, uh, you know, knowing that in cabinet, sometimes uh, we don't always, uh, ministers don't always talk to each other. You know, the idea of mainstreaming into finance is uh, really attractive and providing the incentives. Also, the Sovereign Sustainability Link Fund, fascinating with indicators. Thank you so much for bringing all those out. Now, let me uh, t t turn to Ms. Duarte. Um, and uh, the question to you is, the climate investment funds, the SIFs, have a very strong track record of mobilizing private finance. Given the new contributions from donors and the announcement this morning on the safe capital markets mechanism, what are your expectations for how this can impact the transition for emerging and developing markets? Is it working? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the UK government for inviting us to be here and congratulations on the leadership on climate finance, not just your own contributions, but how you are rallying others to contribute uh, as well, uh, including here at the COP uh, at this moment. Um, our message is a message of hope. Uh, we talk a lot, and even in the plenary this morning, we several of the speakers uh, talked about uh, blended finance and the need to do more with blended finance. Uh, we, we are a mechanism and we were set up uh, in 2008 on the back of the last financial crisis um, where really we weren't seeing many uh, climate aligned investments in developing countries. Um, and uh, under the leadership of the G8, these funds were, were established and we have now demonstrated over these 13 years that we, we have been supporting developing countries, 72 developing countries, more than 300 investments that if we use the scarce public capital and we actually pro provide it at a certain scale and we provide capital that takes risks that others aren't prepared to take, that is actually concessional, so it decreases the cost of capital, and that are patient, which means that can be paid back over a longer time frame, um, and you focus this capital in strategic priorities and you bring the right partners to collaborate together, the multilateral development banks, with the governments and the private capital, you can actually achieve a lot. And we can achieve a lot in terms of the policies, changing the policies that then enable the private capital to come in and invest more in the countries, 
We can actually jumpstart markets where they haven't existed before. We can support the, the uh, private uh, developers and the commercial lenders. And we have multiple examples of this happening in markets that many would have thought this is not possible. Certainly, where many would have thought this is not possible in 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, and so what we want to see more of now going forward, and also with the new investment programs we will be launching tomorrow on energy transition, is seeing more and scaling up more of those. So when we de-risk geothermal investments, for example, because the private sector won't invest in, in, unless something, somebody de-risks that earlier stage proven the resource. When we work with the local commercial institutions, the financial institutions, and provide the technical assistance to them, and actually then on lend to them on more concessional terms so that they can actually open up that market, provide those credit lines, we are mobilizing that local commercial debt markets. And when we um, provide guarantees to platforms that are actually aggregating assets and issuing domestic bonds, we are also making a strong contribution to mobilizing the domestic markets. So we want to see a lot more of that, and we will play our part. Um, but in addition to that, what uh, we have been working on, and it was announced this morning by both uh, Secretary Yellen and the Chancellor Sunak at, at the plenary, we, we started to think about, okay, what more can we do? So we ourselves plan next year to, on the back of the assets we have in one of our funds, issue bonds in the capital markets. And this is a very attractive proposition to investors, and we know because we have been talking to them, we have this portfolio of um, investments uh, diversified across the, across the globe, from multilateral development banks, which are agencies that understand these markets, are operating in these markets, and have track records. And it's going to be completely aligned with climate goals because that's exactly what we do. So we expect with this to be able to um, enable new commitments of the order of half a billion. It could go up to 700 million, as the uh, Chancellor Sunak mentioned. And with that, mobilize over the next 10 years an additional, we hope, at least 50 billion more worth of investments. Um, so this, this is our additional contribution. But we are also exploring other ways where we can partner directly with, with the private investors to even mobilize further um, through our platform. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of interesting things to uh, pick up on. Uh, on. The issue of de-risking is so important, as you said. I mean, the perception of risk in some of the developing market, mar emerging markets and developing countries is sometimes far more than the actual risk. But in order to get investors to, to enter those markets, we have to do the kinds of things you're doing. And it's very exciting to hear about your investment program on energy transition, opening up of domestic markets, which are sometimes really not well appreciated what they can do. Um, and your new, uh, this announcement on half a billion, fabulous. So thank you very much, very interesting news. So l let's uh, shift now uh, to the uh, Mr. Valahu. Um, <clears throat> PIDG is uh, particularly active in sub-Saharan Africa. South and Southeast Asia. Uh, what lessons are you drawing uh, from your experiences of mobilizing finance for sustainable infrastructure in these regions? Thank you, Dr. Ngozi and Secretary of State. Thank you for your opening remarks. I think you've um, laid it out very nicely for me with some of the comments that you've made on patient capital and mobilization of institutional uh, funding. So if I look at the lessons drawn over the last 20 years, I'd pick up on two or three points. And let's, let's start with the uh, piece on patient capital. If I look at projects that we've developed, solar in Malawi with battery storage, a first, solar in Chad, solar in Guinea, electric mobility in Kenya, rooftop solar in the Philippines, these are all today bankable projects, which people would have thought are not bankable. What it required is the right instruments and working with local partners. And people often forget that the local partner piece is critical. This morning, there was an announcement by the Mobilis team with FCDO. And I mention that because we're one of the finalists um, and one of the five uh, proposals 
where we have teamed up with Helios. So we bring to the table project development and early patient capital to bear with operating assets in Sub-Saharan Africa. Helios brings the fund management experience and there you have a, a, the ability to create a new instrument that will be able to tap into, at some point, institutional money because you've got the ticket size, you've got the geographic diversification and technology diversification. And so that's for me quite exciting. I think yesterday we announced um, new commitments, but this is changing every day, obviously, of 300 million covering a number of renewable energy projects and green finance projects. But the more important thing there was that that 300 mobilizes potentially 2.5 equivalent from the private sector. The third point is, for me, quite critical when I look at the 20 years of experience is localization of solutions. And one often talks about localization of solutions in terms of supply chains, but it's much more than that. So when I look at our work in development of local capital markets, and Dr. Ngozi will be very familiar with the work that we've done with the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority to create an entity that essentially provides wraps for Naira-denominated bond issuance in Nigeria. We've set up the same thing with uh, Pakistan, Colin Frazamin, the CEO is sitting in the front row there. And that, again, is an opportunity to unleash pension funds, insurance companies in those two markets, and we expect to deploy more. But it's also, when talking about local capital markets development, green bonds. So you may have seen last year the uh, issuance of a green bond in Kenya, the first in Eastern Africa, to finance student accommodation to allow university students in Nairobi to have a proper place to reside during their studies in a green building. And this was the first with a double listing both on the London Stock Exchange and in the Nairobi Stock Exchange. So that again, when you're talking about development of local capital markets, you are working with the regulators, you're working with the domestic pension funds, you're working with the investment managers, and you're creating a whole ecosystem around that capital market development to, again, unlock patient um, pension fund money, which doesn't always have to be cross-border. It can, it can be domestic. So for me, if I, if I conclude, um, the, when, I, when, I, when I think of all this, I sense the, the urgency. And for me, that sense of urgency is something that we have to, to keep in mind every time. And more importantly, perhaps, is that some of the most transformative projects that we have done or are associated with and I think, for example, a PPP in, Kenya, in uh, Rwanda with um, the provision of potable water for 500,000 people in Kigali. It's one of the first water PPPs on the continent. And when you look at how transformative such projects can be and how, at times, very little capital is required, because we talk a lot about the billions and the billions, but very often it's that small piece of patient capital. And then the final piece would be on the guarantees. We keep talking about lending, lending, but guarantees can play an unbelievable role, in particular with the leverage ratios that it can achieve. And again, that is something that we need to do much more. And I think my time is up, so I will stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've managed to pack a lot of information in a very short amount of time. I think all of you have mastered that art. <laughs> but uh, thank you. I mean, what uh, uh, leveraging pension funds. Uh, people don't know, but in African countries, many of them have, uh, at least Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, to name a few, have billions of dollars in pension funds, which are just sitting. Sometimes they're even invested outside of the continent. And having the right instruments to leverage this and really uh, you know, excite the local capital markets as well uh, and, and put them into the kinds of projects you're doing is very exciting. I think we still have quite some ways to go on the continent to be able to use such capital. So thank you. Let me now move to, um, uh, to uh, Mr. Quinn. Uh, you know, HSBC is a heavyweight. <laughs> I used to be on the board of Standard Chartered, so. <laughs> you know, um, your balance sheet is significant, to say the least. And uh, you've taken an active approach to factoring in climate risk to investment decisions. What demand do you see from the private sector side for emerging and developing market assets? And what more is needed to facilitate these investments? Thank you, Dr. Ngozi. Um, I'm going to probably share a few comments, uh, partly disconnected, but I think that ultimately they're all connected. Uh, firstly, the capital markets are extremely active on any sustainable investment projects. And I just look at the first nine months of this year. 
the amount of bonds that have been raised on sustainable uh, investments is double what it was the same time last year. So there's a huge level of activity in capital markets. But the real answer is to go beyond just capital markets. The commercial banks of the world, the private equity of the world, needs to be able to invest in sustainable projects and sustainable infrastructure. So one of the things we've been working on as a, a group of banks, 11 banks that I, I've been chairing a task force, is to try and create an asset class for sustainable infrastructure investment. To create a methodology for assessing whether a project is truly sustainable and on what basis. And that initiative, um, and there's a number of, there's about 100 institutions have been involved in that, the MDBs, governments, the private sector, have come up with what I believe is an important initiative, which is developing a label, a methodology for assessing a project's viability from the point of view of sustainability. And that initiative is called Fast Infra. Fast Infra, I think, allows a range of investors, private investors, equity investors, uh, commercial banks, the bond markets, to look at an initiative on a global basis and assess the sustainability of that initiative in a, in a, in a methodology that is assessed by an independent secretariat, is governed by an independent secretariat, has a degree of validation, that allows then the crowding in of finance into projects at scale. Now, for the large investors of the world, they can do that due diligence themselves. But when you want to mobilize the asset managers of the world and the private equity of the world and the commercial banks of the world, it's important to have a global standard for assessing which projects are sustainable and which do not meet that definition. Because then you can mobilize an awful lot more capital than just the professional investors. Um, now, Fast Infra um, was launched yesterday. Um, we now need to mobilize that. And if I have one request, is that it's looked at seriously by all, um, all institutions in the world. And if you believe that's the right thing to do, then we adopt it and operationalize it. Because that can crowd in private sector finance alongside public sector finance and can allow due diligence to be done at scale rather than on a bilateral basis. The other thing I, I would uh, say is sustainability is going to be achieved partly through technical evolution and innovation and that technical innovation alongside natural capital is going to require a huge amount of investment. And if you don't mobilize the commercial banks in all of the countries of the world and shift their ability to understand how to finance technical innovation that's going to have to take place in all industries, all industries are going to have to reinvent themselves onto a new technology base. And every banker in the world, every investor in the world has got to learn how to bank those new technologies. So there is a significant transformation of the financial services sector to be able to understand the technologies of the future the way they understand the technologies of today. Understand the business cases of the future for those technologies, not just the business cases of today's industries. And I think that's a huge transformation that's got to take place because we have to mobilize the capital behind the large and the small projects the startup businesses and the existing industries that have shaped the world of today who are going to have to transform their technology base for the future. That's a huge amount of transformation that's got to take place. Uh, but I think the capital is there. The capital now needs to find the projects. And to find the projects, you have to have a credible definition of what is a sustainable project and a viable technology. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for that, and uh, congratulations on the launch of the Fast Infra label. I think for the uh, small, smaller investors, um, this is really, really um, very, very important, as you said, and, and being able to crowd in that money and have the kind of labeling that shows that due diligence has been done, I think is critically important. So thank you. 
Well, I don't know. We have seven more minutes. So I think we can go to the last set of questions. We have, I hope, enough time for that. And uh, for just in a minute or two to each one of you, um, let me uh, start with you, Mr. Vello, and say if, if I could give you a magic wand <laughs> in a minute or two, what, what's the one thing you would change right now to enhance and scale up the mobilization of private finance flows to emerging markets and developing countries? The one thing. It's a great question. When you go to an event, I go to an event, we all go to an event, somebody comes up with the idea to create yet a new product, yet a new solution, or God forbid, yet another institution. Let's put a stop to it. We know, and those of us who work in this business, know that the products exist, the solutions are there, we don't need to, carry, to um, create yet another first loss type instruments, they exist. And for God's sake, let's start using them. And let's accept that not one entity has the answers to all. And that, that responsibility can be shared. So when I'm working with you Noel, know, some of your colleagues on this new initiative with um, Temasek uh, to unleash potentially funding to resilient infrastructure in some very difficult markets in Southeast Asia, we're working with you. And we're working with Helios. We're working with others. And it's really a plea that there's no need to create things that exist. It's a tall order. It's a big ask. but. Um, don't reinvent if I have the, the, the baton, I guess I can do that, right? <laughs> okay, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, Madam Minister. Thank you. As I said at the beginning, the, the main uh, objective uh, should be to walk the, the talk. So in that sense, I think that the magic wand uh, that I would like uh, should be aligning the incentives of uh, private investors, of multilaterals, of financing system, of sovereigns, of donors. So uh, as Minister of Finance, I think that it's important, the, the power the financial incentives have is, is, is a lot. So we have to push the world to put the money where they care. And that's walking the talk. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Quinn? Um, I think the initiative uh, that we've talked about, the ADB initiative with Temasek and HSBC and a few other investors, I'd just like to see that multiplied 100 times. Um, that, that methodology of co-investing, of collaboration, becomes the norm of the future. Um, I think there's an architecture there. And the conversations I've had since that announcement with other investors, there's a huge amount of appetite to, to, to do that. So I'd just like to replicate that across the world. Thank you. Ms. Duarte, you have the final word. <laughs> and I'm going to do it slightly differently because when you talk about magic, it takes me to a <laughs> different um, dimension. So if I had that magic wound, what I would do is enable every one of us to actually experience the impact of these investments we are making in developing countries. Feel it, be on the ground, feel, see the difference that it is making, because I think it would motivate people to act a lot more uh, speedily. And um, um, yes, it, it, I think it would motivate people to, uh, to really internalize this urgency we are talking about and really come together a lot more, like we, we are hearing here today, uh, in strong partnerships uh, and, and bring this, uh, New level of uh, a new level of ambition um, to become a reality. So that that would be my magical wand. Well, thank thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a wonderful, uh, fantastic uh, panel. So um, not easy to to wrap up, but we've all heard. Walk the talk. <laughs> Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, have a standard for sustainability. And uh, feel, feel the projects and investments that are being done. I like that very much. Um, it's really challenging to sum up such a wide-ranging uh, discussion. Uh, we've heard a range of perspectives this morning, uh, including some specific examples of what is working, what has worked, and what we need to look for, uh, to for the future. Um, we've heard uh, Minister, <coughs> the Minister of Uruguay talk about um, the, the need to provide appropriate incentives uh, that would crowd in people. Um, we've heard uh, 
the perspectives on the multilateral funds with their long-standing experience of mobilizing finance. And uh, it's really heartening to hear the amount of money you've mobilized and the uh, projects that they've, they've gone into. More importantly, I think, and very exciting, is what is being done to crowd in finance that uh, ordinarily would not be, we wouldn't have been able to crowd in to develop and deepen domestic capital markets. There's a lot of potential there that is uh, often overlooked. And that's something that we really need to think about when we think about uh, uh, climate finance. So um, it looks promising. I'm excited and um, at what is going on. Sometimes you don't really know the full range of what is happening. And so it's uh, fantastic to hear all of you. So um, let's, uh, you know, let me say this. I think what you are doing is a call to action for everyone here. We each have a role we can play in trying to see. I mean, if you're in this audience, it means you're interested in climate finance. And uh, there's a role that we can all play, more than enough for all of us to do. Uh, whether it's trying to bring in pensions, pension money that hasn't been uh, put to good use, deepen domestic capital markets in doing that, crowding investors, de-risk investments. There's so much that we can all do. So. All I have to say to all of us is let's get on and do it. Thank you.